Now, Nigeria is one of the most linguistically diverse countries in the world, with over 500 languages spoken. But there is only one official language, English. All education is taught in English, and it is the major language of communication in government offices and business establishments. But for years, Nigerians traveling for study or work have had to write an exam proving their proficiency in the language. Of the 18 countries exempt from doing this test, there isn't a single African one, despite English being an official language in 20 countries on the continent. A new campaign by the public policy organization, the Policy Shapers, has been asking the UK Home Office to reform its IELTS policy for Anglophone Africans. Its petition addressed to Home Secretary Priti Patel has received over 72,000 votes and counting, and its campaign has even received an endorsement from Vice President Yemi Oshibaja. I agree entirely that, um, first of all, this is an English-speaking country. Uh, we, should, uh, we should be uh, beneficiaries of some concessions as opposed to being forced every two years to take the same test, especially if you had passed it once before. So I think this is something that we should really uh, work on. And um, this is a point that we can follow up. I agree entirely that, um, first of all, this is an English-speaking country. Uh, we, should, uh, we should be uh, beneficiaries of some concessions. As all right, for more on this topic, I have with me the founder of Policy Shapers, Ebenezer Wikina, and the organization's policy campaigner, Donatus Iluko. Uh, and I'll go to you, um, Donatus. Uh, just give us an insight into what this campaign has been able to uh, bring uh, to you o over time. Now, what, what are the quick wins that you've been able to get? Uh, we know that the general one, which is um, you asking Britain to actually have a change in its policy, hasn't uh, you know surfaced at the moment. But what exactly are the quick wins that you've been able to get all through this campaign? Well. Uh as a result of this campaign, I've noticed that as a people we are developing, I've noticed that we are, we are continuously seeking changes to what becomes of us as a people. Also, I've realized that the Nigerian people are beginning to engage the global system with, forms, with all forms of logic, realities, and facts. And they are beginning to say no to all forms of neocolonial manipulations, colonial vestiges, and all forms of imperial relations between the country and other parts of the world. So the, the, the campaign itself, as it, as it is, is an initiative of the Policy Shapers Group, and it is aimed at addressing the challenges we face as a people when it comes to migration. People migrate for businesses, people migrate for tourism, people migrate for educational reasons. And most, most, of, most of the times, Nigerians are subjected to some do's and don'ts. And one of the do's that Nigerians are subjected to by the UK's office is the proficiency of English as a language. Well, we have come to say no to this issue that have been sitting on our neck, or should you say that we have been carrying as a burden for the past 33 years, ever since the introduction of the IAS policy in 1989. We have discovered that we were colonized by these people. We've discovered they handed over this language to us as a people upon independence, and then on what basis? do you tell us to still prove proficiency when we do our daily activities as a people with English, when we go to school, basic, primary, secondary, and tertiary with English, when we conduct professional engagements with English. So we, we are saying at this point, the, the, the British office should be more liberal. They should consider the fact that there should be concessions, just like the president outrightly said, given the fact that we were former coloni uh, uh, colonies to their, to, their, to their government. So the, the campaign generally has signaled the fact, again, like I said initially, let me reiterate, the fact that Nigerians are constantly yearning for change and, of course, progressive development. Thank you. All right. Um, uh, I, I will actually come to you, Donatus, and I want you to talk about the inspiration behind this movement, actually, and um, how this movement is beginning to get more wins in terms of more people, you know, coming into the campaign and wanting to get involved. Yeah. Okay. 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 Can you hear? Can you hear us, Donatus? Yes, I can. I can. Well, not really. Uh, Ebenezer. Okay. Yes. Yes, I can. I can hear you. Can you hear me? 
Yeah, just go ahead, I mean. So sorry I got the name mixed up. No worries, no worries. So, um, yeah, it just as, as Donati said, this again signals that Nigerians are standing up to their rights. There was a trend a couple of weeks ago on social media where a young Nigerian who was treated wrongly in Mozambique, you know, shared her experience of not being let into the country and you know, sent back with the next flight before she arrived. And, you know, people just there talking about, people just there asking questions. Why are we not being treated correctly? You know, data shows that Nigerians are some of the best brains that you can find anywhere in the world. A good example is that in the Migration Policy Institute data from 2017, there's data to, to, to prove that Nigerians are the most highly educated, you know, group of nationals anywhere in the, in the U.S. So you have about 61% of Nigerians in the U.S. with at least a bachelor's degree. Compared to, you know, U.S.-born nationals, you have only about 31% of U.S.-born nationals with a, with, a, with a degree and other foreign nationals somewhere at 32%. So if Nigerians are able to, you know, in quotes, outdo people in the U.S., even in the, in the U.S., you know, that just shows you that, you know, the people have tenacity, we have, you know, we have courage, we have everything really that, 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 that is needed. And there's no need why we should be treated, you know, wrongly. So this policy speaks directly to that. And as Donato said, you know, it's, it's high time. It's been 33 years, you know, there's been no need why. People had, of course, come up to speak about this issue at several times. But there's been no need why this should continue for as long as that's continued. Yeah, and I will want to know if you had the personal experience yourself, and that's why you had to take this campaign upon yourself to ensure that the status quo is changed. Yeah, so I, I personally have avoided almost every opportunity that requests for the IELTS as a, as a personal <laughs> as a personal belief because I personally just think it's very insulting to me. You know, for someone who used to work as a as a journalist wrote for various international media platforms, you know, served on so many organizations, and then I'm still told to write the, the IELTS exam. But however, from a personal standpoint, my great-grandfather was a colonial interpreter. He used to interpret for the colonial masters here in Ogoni land, here in River State. And, you know, he was very instrumental in, in tra translating the Bible from, the, from, from English to Kana language. And, you know, I mean, how many years after, I'm, I'm 29 years old now, I hardly can speak the Kana language. And there's so many young people who are within my age range who are struggling to even understand and communicate in their indigenous language. Why? Because we've been speaking English all our lives. We learn English in school from kindergarten all the way to tertiary institution. And so if we will go through all of this for all of these years of our lives, why do we still need to pay an amount that is almost twice the minimum wage in Nigeria, and the result for these tests expire every two years. We just thought it didn't make any sense to us. Yeah. Yeah, and I'll come to you, Donatus. I mean, I was reading the experience of um, a, a, a classroom teacher who actually teaches English in Nigeria, in a Nigerian university, and um, he had to go for this, uh, you know, uh, test and he was just wondering why he had to be, you know, asked to do that because after explaining himself that he had been teaching English language in Nigeria for quite some years, he just felt that there was no need. Uh, but here you have people like this having this experience. What exactly do you think needs to be done urgently to reverse the situation? Well, I think we need more engagement to reverse this issue. Is just a matter of more engagement. The government will also have to join us. You can already see, as a youth organization, we are doing our best. Yeah, I mean, you've already got support from Vice President Yemi Yes, yeah, you know, according to the, the, the past president of our country, Nigeria, in person of Chief Olushenko Basanjo, he recently espoused a belief that I'm very, very uh, uh, good, good with, or that I accept to a very large extent. He said that, but those days we usually say that the, there is a need for political will. But now he said that the political will has to be matched by political action. So it's not enough for the for the Vice President, the SLNC, to tell us that, yes, there is need for consensus and stuff like that. We need the government to come up and engage the Home Office, make them understand the reasons why they should stop this thing. For example, the United Nations have said that about 51% of Nigerians are below the age of, uh, sorry, the United Nations have said that about 62% of Nigerians are below the age of 25. And then, Statista have stated that about 62, again, are also proficient in English. 
When you do that arithmetic, you discover that about 46% of young Nigerians are proficient in English language. And again, according to the benchmark given by the Home Office, for you to be added to the majority English-speaking country, you have to have beat at least your population should be speaking about 51% of 51%, should yeah. be speaking uh, should English. be proficient in English. And now we have just the young population over 46%. So uh, from 25 years up above, are you saying that Nigerians cannot beat up to like maybe 50, 60, 70 percent of proficiency? So when you go by statistics also, you see that we have the facts and figures to change this narrative. So what we just need is more engagement. And this engagement comes in the form of more politically relevant persons getting involved, more civil societies taking up the campaign, and we ourselves, the Policy Shapers Initiative, doing more work getting more engagement with the Home Office to make yeah. sure that this policy uh, and is... And that's what I want to that. ask Donatus, if you've made efforts into getting the Nigerian authorities through the... Uh, uh, sorry, Ebenezer, mm -hmm. getting uh, the Minister of Education involved in all of this. Uh, as a founder of the Policy Shapers, what initiative have you done to ensure that policymakers are involved in uh, having a government-to-government -government conversation between Nigeria and the UK, for example? We have, we have. So following the engagement of the vice president, I mean, I, I made a speech as a Mandela Washington fellow um, at the engagement session with the vice president and the ambassador of the U.S. to Nigeria. And, you know, since then he has said, okay, he has instructed these people to go on, to go on with the issue. We are written a couple of times to our federal ministries, you know, and, you know, being innovative young Nigerians, following up and following up and just sitting around just seems like a very, very... Um, adaptive or reactive thing to do. And so we just thought, you know what, change those Org's office in Nigeria, got in touch with, with us and said, you guys are doing a great job. Why not set up a petition? And so about three or four weeks ago, we set up a petition and we just said, let's begin to even get collateral. Let's, let's show that it's not an issue that only policy shapers cares about. Like this is an issue that's a wide, is a, is a wide thing. So within three weeks, we got over 70,000 young people from across the country, out of the country, just signing the petition and showing, adding their voice to the, to the issue. We took it a step further. So we've, we've written to the Home Office in October 2021, and we made an official inquiry to find out what that requirement is, because the requirement is not anywhere on the internet, you know, which is very, very, which you think is very, very funny. Usually, all of those things are written out plain on, plain on paper. So we, we didn't see it online. And so we just thought, okay, let us find out what this requirement is. And then that's when it got back in touch with us to let us know that 51% is their criteria for that uh, engagement. And that they don't have enough public evidence, you know, to add Nigeria to the list. And so, of course, the Policy Shapers team, the tax force members, we do not is, is one of us. All of us got in, you know, took the next two weeks between January 26th and yesterday to just carry out DEX research, engagement, asking questions, just trying to get data that we put together in a policy brief, which we have now officially communicated to the Home Office in response to their point, you know, saying this is data from the UN, data from Statista, this is data from, you know, West African Examination Council that shows that over the past five years, Nigeria has gotten, Nigerian students who sat for WIAC have gotten up to 5 million English credits. Like, what other kind of data do you, what kind of, what other form of public evidence can be public evidence, really? There's data from every source that we put together in that 15 page, you know, brief, and we've shared that with them, and we're hoping that that will be able to help us take the question forward. Very interesting indeed, uh, Beniza. We can now ask you to just hold on there while we go on this short break. When we come back, we'll talk about how this affects more young people, the cost of it, and of course, the requirement for you to repeat it after two years. You're still watching the Arise interview, plenty more still ahead. Welcome back to the Arise interview. I'm Somna Sambo. Now, several Nigerians have signed a petition calling on the British government to remove its requirement for language tests for students uh, traveling for study or work. In its response, the UK Home Office said it did not have evidence that majority of the people in Nigeria speak English as their first language. So what next? I still have with me Ebenezer Wikina, the founder of Policy Shapers, the group that created that petition and the organization's policy campaigner, uh, Donatus Iluko. And then, uh, Donatus, I'll just go to you on the issue of cost. How expensive is this? And then uh, I use also campaigning for the cost of these IELTS to be reduced. Um, well, uh, on our campaign is not, not, not largely aimed at reducing the costs per se. Our campaign is, is largely aimed at 
scrapping the policy. Yeah, but before well, then, at least, yes. if that could be a quick win for you. <laughs> okay, okay, yeah, that's true. But then, if you look at the cost implication, definitely it's on the health side. The, 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 the exams are like three times the, the, the minimum wage of Nigerians. And, and again, you remember that how many Nigerians, as we speak currently, can assess the minimum wage? A lot of Nigerians don't even have access to livelihood. And you know that our economic realities tend to prepare us more to you know, having issues of migration, probably for education, for, for, for greener pastures and stuff like that. So you, you find out that a lot of young Nigerians have reasons to always want to travel out of the country. And this now becomes a challenge because the Home Office will always tell you that you have to demonstrate your English proficiency where you have, been, you, have been, you have been doing all your activities as a citizen in Nigeria with English. So the, the whole issue becomes illogical. And the fact that it's also on a high side, also considering the fact that after two years, you yeah, have what, what's, what's the cost actually? Uh, what's the cost as at now? As at now, it's about, it's about 88,000 80, 80, there about, just roughly the, uh, the minimum wage three times. Just roughly the minimum wage three times. So now, if you look at the fact that again, just after two years, you tell us that what we just did two years ago has expired. We should go and write again. You see, it's, it's, it now seems like a form of exploitation on the part of the British government on the Nigerian people, especially given the fact that, as I've always said, we've demonstrated over time that this is our language. We've shown, with, even with statistics, that substantiate the fact that we are good with this language. It is not foreign to us. We use it on a daily. Like my, my colleague earlier said, in 2016, between 2016 and, uh, 2016 and 2021, Nigerians recorded over a 60% of pass in West Africa Examination Council's exam. And out of that 50%, it will, it, will be, it, will be, it will be a pleasure to let you know that about 5 million students pass the English language with credits. So now, you can imagine how, how, how students who have not even undergone their tertiary institution, talk about their professional lives, can even be passing the English language exams. So oh, you, right. there is no reason whatsoever. So therefore, we, we are looking for how to probably scrap the policy. But then, like you said, on a win-win basis, if for the now, our advocacy wins us a, a concession in terms of the pricing, fine, but we are not relating well, on but that. But the ultimate aim is actually is to, to get scrap. <laughs> scrap. Yes. All right. And then I'll come to you, Ebenezer. Uh, how, how much does this policy actually affect young people in Nigeria who want to migrate uh, and then even across Africa generally? And then do you by chance think that this policy is racist and... Uh, haven't you had others also asking you why the British authorities would have to be doing this after uh, having Nigeria belonging to the Commonwealth and all of that? Shouldn't we be having this as one of those, uh, you know, things that come along with, uh, you know, being colonized with Britain and then being a member of the Commonwealth? Very, very well said, true. We, we definitely should, especially if you look at that list that Donatos referred to earlier, the majority English-speaking country list. There are about 19, maybe 18 countries on that, on that list. About 11, nine countries are there from the Caribbean. And, you know, you look at countries like Jamaica, Babel.com says that Jamaica, you know, Jamaican Patois is the language that is more widely spoken, you know, and you have only about 50,000 people who are proficient in English, according to Babel.com. You have a country, the small island nation in, in Europe called Malta as well, about 98% of the population in Malta speaks a language called Maltese. This is data from the European Commission, you know, and only about 70% plus that are proficient in, in English. But at least their first language is Maltese. It's not, it's not even the English, right? So if these countries can make this particular list, right? So come on. I mean, there's, there's Ghana, there's South Africa, there's Kenya. There, all of these countries in Africa, there's not just even one of those countries on the continent making that, that list. I mean, it leaves a lot of questions, really. And it raises a lot of issues around decolonization. People have said that even though colonization seems to have ended a long time ago, there's still scraps and pieces of it all across the continent. And you know, this particular issue, just saying that there's no African country on that, on that list, further raises this, this, this issue to the, to the fore. As for how this affects young Nigerians, I see, it as, I see it as one, us trying to regain that fight for our reputation. You know, sadly, Nigeria has a very poor reputation abroad. Despite the statistics that I read earlier of us having, you know, some of the best minds, about 10,000 Nigerians are working in the NHS in, the, in England alone, in, 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 in threatening the health system there. 
There are Nigerians almost everywhere, all over the world. And, you know, it's, it's just sad that you only see those negative stories being pushed out there. And, that's, and that narrative just being pushed down all across international media. And so we believe that this, in the first way, begins to start that battle to reclaim our international pride and our international dignity. Secondly, you know, ICIR reported sometime in 2020 during COVID that Nigerians spend almost close to $5 billion a year on these, on these tests. There was a result from, there was a report from 2017 that said almost 3 million Nigerians took the test from one of the education service providers you know, that conducts this, this test. So if you do the maths, 89,500 times 3 million or 2 million people. I mean, you can see how much money leaves the shores of the country. You know, so putting, putting an end to this doesn't just have an economic, you know, an economic uh, uh, ad, ad, advantage or benefit. It also has, you know, something that also helps us to push towards language equality. It also helps us to also bring back our dignity and our reputation. And I was actually country. referring to that issue of if you think... Um, this uh, policy is actually racist uh, because, I mean, you look at African countries being targeted by this and you would want to ask why it's like that. And then um, the, the second aspect is that do you think that the British authorities are in one way or the other trying to reduce the number of people who want to come into their country? That's why they, they keep on enforcing this policy by making sure that young people don't migrate, uh, especially to the UK. Yeah. Not at all. I mean, that would be that would be counterproductive for them because currently the UK is doing something called the simplification of rules. So in 2019, the Law Commission in, in the UK wrote a report to the Home Office and told the Home Office, gave them some recommendations on how they can simplify their immigration rules in order to attract a lot more people, best brains into their into their country. And it's interesting to know that between 2013 and 2018, there has been a drop in the number of Nigerian students that go into the UK, right? Most students now go to Canada and there's several European countries that have lesser restrictions that are beginning to get you know, students. So there's been a 41% decrease between 2013 and 2018. And this trend continues to 2019 and 2020. So the UK, in their international education strategy, they actually write Nigeria as one of their priority markets. Right? So, if, so if, if they say this test is a way to reduce us from coming, I think that's counterproductive, right? Because in your, in your report that is online, you already said Nigeria is a market for you. You're targeting us. So if you're targeting us, I mean, a good way to show that you take us seriously is first of all to add us to this majority English speaking countries. Because over time, we have proven the Nigerian population has grown. Most of the young people who are under 25 have shown that they are proficient in this language and very larger. In a proportion of the, of the population. Very interesting submission you've got there indeed. Uh, Beniza Wikina, who is the founder of uh, Policy Shapers, and we've got uh, Donatus Iluho here in the studio with me. He's a campaigner with Policy Shapers, too. This group of young guys actually campaigning to ensure that Nigeria is removed from the IELTS requirements by the UK authorities. Uh,